All right, you guys, I'm doing a little something new for you guys today, and it's actually my first video that I'm doing this. I'm doing a spoiler video review for you guys on the new movie, It Chapter 2. So before I even get into this spoiler review of the movie, I just want to go ahead and get something out in the open. I don't care if specific movies will actually change a little bit from what they are doing in the novel. Like, I don't mind that at all. So if something is different in the movie compared to the novel, I'm not going to, you know, knock the movie down because of it. Sometimes changes in movies are actually for the better. A good example of a good change in a movie is Thor from the Marvel franchise. Thor in the comic books is a little, I guess you'd say, less relatable than the Thor in the movies, and he's also not as funny. Like, Thor in the movies is, like, straight up a clown. He's completely a clown, he's hilarious, he's joking, he does all he does all sorts of loony, loony crazy things. But Thor in the comic books is actually more serious and he's more stoic than the Marvel version. But I actually like that change. It, it puts more flavor into the movie, you know. You can't have every character in the Marvel franchise be stoic, and some characters need to be a little, you know, a little different. So Thor changing into more of a clown and a comic relief type of character is actually a good change in my opinion. So I'll go ahead and say, like for this It movie, if they change something for the better, I'll go ahead and say something about it. I'll say, yep, that was a good change. But if they change something for the worse, that's where I get annoyed and I'll actually dock points on a movie. Just getting that out of there because I know if I say I don't like this part in the movie and then someone says, hey, but it was in the novel, sometimes things that are adapted into a movie is not good. It's not a good transition from novel to movie, and sometimes they do need to change things up, so I'm just getting that out there. The movie begins at a carnival where two gay couples are having a good time. I forget what their names are in the novels, but this is actually straight from the novel, so I think it's Malone. I think it's Malone or Melon or something like that. That's one of the gay couple's names. He's hanging out with his buddy, and they're having a good old time, and then you see these racist hillbilly type of kids that they're kind of like a small gang, I guess you'd say. They don't like them. And then when, uh, as the gay couple are crossing the bridge, you know, they're just, I guess they're just walking along, going back to their house or whatever, the, uh, the group, the bullies slash racists are, you know, they start beating the crap out of them. And they do that, and they actually do the novel justice. They, they go exactly how the novel says. They beat them up, one person's based near death, and they throw the person off the bridge. They throw, um, I think it's Malone's love interest off the, off the bridge, and he just falls off and lands in the water. Perfect. Actually, beat for beat, like the novel, and I think that's really interesting, and it really, you know, the way Stephen King actually wrote the novel and how they he put so much explanation about the scenery, exactly what's going on, it... It, pic it was pictured perfectly in my mind from the novel, and it was great. And this is actually the first time they actually showed this in the movie. You know, like the past It movies or whatever, the, the TV show, they never showed this scene because it's a little too brutal. They throw a lot of racism and kind of like social commentary in there, and I think they just were like, this is a PG-13 movie. We can't have this in the movie, period. Done. So it's, I'm glad that they brought it back in this movie just so I could see that part, which is great. Basically, as the guy falls into the water, he's drowning, he's beat up, he can barely see... And then he sees somebody out of the corner of his eye where he's, you know, barely drowning. He's a clown. The clown looks like he's trying to help him out out of the water. And also they're in a, at a carnival, so it's a kind of a fair. So a clown in that circumstance doesn't seem out of the question. But then again, the eyes are glowing on the clown and he looks creepy and dark and stuff like that. So I don't know if you want to grab that hand. I'd just float down river. Obviously, the two gay couples are in a relationship and one of them runs down to go save his buddy because he's, you know, in the water drowning. You know, who, who wouldn't? Who, would, who wouldn't save their lover? So anyways, he goes down there and he sees across the river the clown holding up his friend. Now, he's holding him up almost as if he's helping him, you know, like one arm over the shoulder and then Here's his buddy or whatever. He's picking him up. Almost looking like he's trying to help him. He looks like he's right about to help him and be like, oh, there he is. He's across river, though. Has him right there, and then he opens his mouth as wide as a lion. And I think that's actually uh, in the movie. I think that's what he, how they explain it. Opens his mouth as wide as a lion with teeth about, you know, six inches thick or six, six inches long. And just crunches down on his armpit and rips a huge chunk out of him. And that's the end of that scene in the movie. Now, personally for me, I really like that scene. Just, you know, just watching the movie. It's a, it's a really cool scene and it goes straight from the novel. The problem is, is that it's not needed in the movie. And I'll explain why. The reason why I need to cut this from the movie is because A, the movie is just way too long. It's, it's three hours long. It's a long ass movie. You know, it's like you're sweating by the time you're out because it's like, you're sitting there like, wow, Jesus, it felt like I, I'd been watching this movie for four or five hours. It, it, that's how long it feels. The other reason is that there's a storyline with Henry Bowers 
that they don't actually emphasize and they really needed to do that. But if they would have cut some of the non-plots from the movie that didn't really need to happen, they would have been able to put the Jeffrey, or Jeffrey, Henry Bowers, uh, I guess you'd say, plot in the movie. But they didn't. They cut one of the main parts or the main plot lines from the movie in showcase of this plot, which wasn't really a plot in the movie. And I'll explain what it was in the novel. Sorry, you guys, I'm going to look up uh, this guy's name. It's uh, Adrian Mellon. I, I knew it was Mellon. Anyways, Adrian gets thrown off the bridge, and then it ends up killing him. His partner goes to the police, you know, like anybody would after a crazy traumatic event like that, you know, where someone dies. The police interrogate him, or not interrogate, they ask him questions. They say, all right, these bunch of racists beat you guys up, and we understand that we want to throw these guys behind bars because they're kind of a menace to our society. Well, Mellon's partner says, well, they did beat up my, you know, my partner, and threw him off the bridge, but I saw a clown. I saw a clown kill my friend like a, like a lion, took a bite out of him like a vampire almost, and then thousands of balloons floated down from underneath the overpass and flooded me, and I couldn't see what happened, just like it happened in the movie. Now, this is the part where you get to see in the novel the behind the scenes of what the, I guess you'd say, the, the entire town understands that there's something weird going on. Like, they actually show off that people understand there's some sort of supernatural event going on in the town, and it also showcases that the town is particularly racist and kind of effed up and screwed up, because he even explains that um, before before the, the event even happens where the, the, the two gay couples get attacked on the bridge and thrown off the bridge and stuff like that, they explain that there's a bunch of racist graffiti on the walls, uh, people don't like them in the town, a lot of them want to leave the town, I think they're like one of the only gay couples. Everyone's like, well not only, there's just a very few, there's a small bar that has gay couples or whatever. But other than that, they kind of flesh out the town as if the town is almost related to the monster. He says that the when he looked into the eyes of the clown, it, it felt like dairy. That's the best way he could explain it. Dairy and him were interconnected with each other. So it flushes up the town and the environment with this scene. Problem is, is that in the movie, they don't do that. It's just a scary scene where a, a guy gets beat up by a bunch of racists and throw off the bridge. The other thing is, too, is that it doesn't really make any sense in this time period. Now, I do understand gay people get beat up all the time. You know, I mean, I'm sure there's people that hate gay people and stuff like that happens. The problem is, is that it's supposed to be like the 1990s in this scene, or I think maybe even later. Actually, it's later. It's supposed to be modern day time. And at a carnival, I mean, they were blatantly getting beat up, like right next to the carnival. And most people would step in and say, what, you know, what the, what the fuck are you doing? You know, what, what are you doing? There's like six or seven people beating up on these two guys. And in today's society, that rarely, rarely like happens. You know, um, it doesn't doesn't happen all the time. As in, in the novel in 1960s, that was way more taboo than it is now, and people will kind of just roll with it. You know, just be like, oh, we're, we don't, we're not gonna, we're not gonna see anything. They're gay. We don't care about the gays or whatever. So it, it felt a little out of out of place with that, but also felt out of place in a narrative perspective. It didn't really showcase the town's. I guess you'd say animosity and racism, and they also it also doesn't showcase the fact that it is actually interconnected with the town, and the town understands there's some sort of supernatural event or supernatural being that kind of hangs out. So what happens is in the novel or whatever is that the the, the the hillbilly racist get blamed for the murder of his friend, which I mean he's he could have died anyways, but they get blamed for the murder as well as a couple other people that might have been found earlier. Same thing with uh, Henry Bowers. Henry Bowers gets blamed for basically all the murders that happened uh, earlier in the in the first movie, and he had like almost nothing to do with most of the murders. I think it was like his dad. Actually, in the beginning when he's a kid, yeah, it's only his dad, and that's it. Everybody else was it. So, anyways, moving on. So, the movie and the novel is pretty close to each other when it comes to The Call. There's just a couple of little aspects that were a little different and didn't flesh out the characters as much, but I understand because they just had such a long runtime already that they could they kind of needed to kind of tone down some of the character development on some of the characters like I explained in my regular review so let me just go ahead and tell you something that's a little different and was a little a little off-putting to me when it came to the call which I actually enjoyed one of the, that was one of my favorite parts in the movies what I'm trying to say Beverly Marsh getting beat up by her husband actually was a pretty good part in the movie. That that basically came from, straight from the book. It almost exactly like the book. They did do something pretty interesting though, which I thought was uh, was pretty clever of the writers when it came to this movie. 
basically in the beginning she's like all right i have to go my friends are calling i you know i need to get out of here and help them out you know after she got the call and the husband's like yeah go ahead honey that's completely fine and the first thing i thought was like oh they uh i guess they're gonna switch up her husband because her husband's like a deadbeat asshole you know just like drinker he's like a frat boy and he you know beats her up for any little thing so when he was like being kind to her, he's like, oh yeah, you can go, like that's completely fine. I was like, oh, they're switching this up, that's kind of interesting. But as soon as she starts walking away, he grabs her and then gets his belt and he's like, oh, you wanna go? I, I knew you were talking to one of your boyfriends or whatever and then starts beating her with the belt. I was like, oh, that just kind of threw me off. I, I liked how they did that. They just kind of were like, you know, they, they were like, oh, it's gonna go to something different. Nope, we're going right back into it. I was like, oh, okay, that, that was interesting that they kind of tried to throw me for a loop like that. Throw me, throw me for a loop like that. So I thought that was pretty cool. So Bill's the same thing that he was in the books. He was a author and he, he wrote for, I guess you'd say TV shows or movies. And uh, he also wrote books, obviously. One of the things that kind of annoyed me in this, I guess you'd say in this movie is that they kept nudging at the fact that Bill was a bad writer when it came to endings. They kept saying, your endings suck. We hate, everyone hates your ending. So you need to do something different, right? And all the, I guess you'd say the director and other people kept telling them that over and over and over in the entire movie. They kept, even like later in the movie, they say the same thing. They're like, oh, we loved your book, but the ending kind of sucked. And it's funny because what they were trying to do was talk shit about Stephen King. They were saying, okay, Stephen King's It was a good book. It was long, but the ending sucked. And even in the movies, the ending sucked. And which is kind of funny and ironic because in this movie, the ending actually sucked just as bad or if not worse than in the novel. So I don't know why they were talking shit about Stephen King, and it was totally a metaphor for that. I mean, the, the character Bill is supposed to be Stephen King, or at least like a, I guess a literature version or another version of Stephen King. Like, he, Stephen King wrote himself into his novel. That's basically what I'm trying to say. And in this movie, they just keep talking shit about how his writing's good, but, like, the ending keeps sucking. And then they go on to make a really shitty, sucky ending. So I was like, go fuck yourselves. Like, why are you talking shit about Stephen King? I don't understand. Richie's a little different. He was a stand-up comedian, not a, uh, uh, like, a talk show host. And uh, that's basically it. He just goes and throws up off the balcony. And he has kind of like an executive person next to him. Or I guess you say one of his, uh, um, uh, I guess you say his little lackeys or whatever that kind of helps him out and gets him prepared to go on stage and stuff like that. And he was like, what, what's going on? And then... While he's about to talk and say some jokes, because he's a comedian, you know, into the audience, uh, they, you know, he just forgot his joke because he was so not mentally prepared for the call that he was receiving. So that's the end of his little thing. Stan's death was a little different, a little lackluster. They didn't really uh, emphasize his story that much. Like, in the book, they actually go into, it's almost from, like, the wife's perspective. Actually, it is from the wife's perspective. Um, his wife is actually kind of the narrator, and you're actually in the mind of the wife when you're reading the novel, when you see his death and when he uh, kills himself, it's actually almost like a little mini story, like a mini scary story within the novel where it it's talking about your loved one, you know, your, your wife or husband or whatever, and how you could see the slight changes in tone and the way they talk and the way they act and stuff like that because of the specific call that he got. And they could see, and she could see just because they were, you know, husband and wife, the little tiny changes in him before he killed himself. And it was almost like, it was pretty heartbreaking actually in the novel, how she was saying that she just decided to watch TV when she, she knew and she realized, you know, in her, in her heart that something changed in him when he got that call, you know? And it's, it's very sad. She's like, no one else would have caught it except for me. And I didn't caught it. I didn't caught it. I didn't catch it. And it was my job to do that, and I didn't, and he killed himself because of that. So the, also, too, the leading up to, like, opening the door and, you know, seeing the uh, the bloody mess in there. Well, actually, he locks the door, and the police show up later. But that was a pretty terrifying thing, like, seeing your loved one kill himself and, you know, in a bloody mess and stuff like that. Like, it, it, that, that's, that's what kind of, that, that's one of the really cool things about the novel. And in the movie, they're just like, oh, by the way, Stan killed himself. So... I knew they weren't gonna like, do a lot with that because they kind of it, it comes across pretty quickly like okay Stan killed himself he can't deal with the situation but in the novel it's almost like its own mini story so I knew they weren't gonna do that it just take too long so I understand that change but I would have liked to see more development and see it from the wife's perspective I think that would have been freaking awesome in the movie but 
you know, it's a three hour long movie and they can't add any more stuff. I mean, they, they could have if they deleted some stuff, but anyways, I'm getting off track. Go to the next person. Um, ben in the movie, he gets the call as an executive and that, that one's pretty boring. And in the novel, he has a lot of flashbacks about his childhood after he gets the call. And that's kind of with everybody, to be honest with you. So let me just move on to Eddie. Eddie in the novel, even as an adult, still has the issues that he had when he was a kid, you know, thinking that he's always sick and he needs the, uh, what is it called, the little puffer or whatever. You know, he has skin problems and he has all sorts of things. He's always looking for, you know, oh, I hope that's not poison ivy sort of person. That, 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 that's the same thing with him as an adult. Has all the same phobias. I mean, even the leper comes back in the movie, but I'll, I'll get into that later. Eddie, the way he gets the call in the movie, he just kind of gets called on the phone and basically he gets hit by a car because he's so concentrated on the phone call that he forgot to stop at a red light. And then that basically ends that scene. And they end the scene kind of funny where he's just like, uh, the guy's like, holy crap, are you all right, Eddie? And Eddie goes, oh yeah, I'm fine. And he had like a goofy face when he said it and they try to like kind of nudge that off as, you know, just kind of comedic relief. But in the novel, it's a little different, and it's a lot its a lot better presented. Eddie in the novel marries a person that looks basically just like his mother and acts just like his mother. And they kind of do a nod to that in the movie where his wife calls, and he goes, oh, bye, Mom. And then she goes, what'd you say, Eddie? And then he's like, oh, never mind, hangs up. But that's, like, very on the surface level. I mean, that gives you, like, a little bit, like, a glimpse into what's going on in his life, but not, you know, doesn't really dive too deeply into it. But in the novel, basically, his his wife slash mother represents his mom from the past. I mean, she even acts like his mom and is obese like his mother. He actually does really love her, and she tries to kind of control him kind of like his mom. Like, he goes, I need to go somewhere. I need to leave. My friends are calling for me. I got the call that I need to be. I, I can't explain that I'm going to go fight a killer clown. So he just says, I have to go. I can't explain it. My friends need me. Well, his wife sits in front of the door. And she's like, well, you have to explain what's going on, Eddie. And she's like crying. She really does love him. And he actually really loves her. And they actually kind of work for each other as like a romance. I guess you'd say in the beginning of the story in the novel. It Because her... Her little, I guess I say, her problem is that she eats food. She eats too much food, and that's how she drains out her depression and her anxiety and her problems in her life. Well, with Eddie, because he had some sort of mental trauma, you know, he had some so much mental trauma from his mother being so, you know, crazy with him and, you know, kind of sheltering him and stuff like that, and with the monster It, that he still relies on his old phobias and his old, you know, mentality of, you know, having the puffer, even though it's placebos and stuff like that, to go ahead and coast his way through life. And that's pretty cool. And he ends up explaining kind of that he actually really does love her. And she thinks because she's so fat and obese that he, he's trying to leave her. And that's why she's so, you know, she's, she's crying. She's like just sobbing, crying in the novel, like going, I don't want you leaving me, Eddie, you know. And he's like, no, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I swear I'm coming back but I have to do something with my friends. And I know this is not like me. You know, I'm usually kind of in the house. I don't want to, you know, do anything dangerous, but this is something that I really need to do. I need to face my fears that I kind of left behind as a, as a, I was going to say, say child, as a kid. So that's a little different in the novel. And I actually really like that in the novel. And they don't have enough time to explain that in the movie. And, you know, they just can't, they couldn't flesh out a lot of the characters in the movie. So it's, it's kind of, it kind of sucks, but that's like, in the novel, there's actually not a lot of it, like the clown it. There's like other monsters and other representations of it. But to be honest with you, the novel is more about the character development of each character. And it actually helps with the novel because because of the character development, you're actually more afraid when these big bad things happen with the monster it. But they just don't have enough time to flesh out the characters so much as adults in this movie. So, and I feel like in this movie particularly, they were like, oh, well, we already flushed them out as children, so we don't need to flush them out as adults as much. The problem is, though, is that it's 27 years later. Like, you're a different human being three years from now, four years from now, five years from now. 27 years, and from, a ch like, childhood to adulthood is a ridiculous ridiculous transition they're not even the same characters anymore they don't like the same things they don't they don't they're not like each other anymore now some of them are like obviously eddie married his mom and is still kind of comforted by the the way his mom treated him and that's why he married his wife that basically is like 
a direct representation of his mom. But most of the characters were, you know, they, they, they change over time, especially over 27 years. So they really needed to develop the characters in part two and show us how they changed. But they almost like none of them really changed that much. That's that's kind of one of the issues. And in the book, they really did, you know. So there you go. That's my problem with it. Interesting thing, too, is that uh, in the movie, they have a part where Bill, like, after he gets the call, looks at his hand, and he has, like, if you if you watch closely, if you haven't watched the movie yet, I don't know why you're watching this, but let's say if you already watched it, watched it, part two. God, it's so hard to explain that. Um, he has the cut in his hand, and he has a scar from when they all made the, the deal and, you know, when they're all holding hands as children. Well, he looks at his hand, and he looks like he's puzzled by something that's on his hand at the end of his scene. Well, in the novel, they explain that the scar wasn't there until he got the call. It's almost like everybody had scarring on them, like physical scarrings from either A, the monster, or the, the promise that they made, or, you know, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, I keep saying Jeffrey, Henry Bowers cutting the H into, um, into Ben. A lot of them forgot what happened, and a lot of them don't even realize that they have scars until the phone call happened and all these memories flood back the scar actually pops up on his hand almost like magic. And even in the novel, the his wife, uh, Bill's wife, explains, I don't remember seeing that scar on your hand until now. And he says, I know. It's almost like none of this stuff ever happened until I got this phone call. And then all these memories that I, want, I once forgot are all flooding back in. I almost feel like a brand new person. Like I feel like a, a different person. And that it's kind of this weird mystical thing element with it that uh, they don't really get into that much into the movie. But in the novel, basically, it actually made them very successful in kind of weird ways. And he also kind of almost like casted a curse on them where they kind of forgot their memories of the past. Because they, the Losers Club, actually hurt them or hurt it. It's hard to explain that hurt it in the past. He doesn't want them coming back to Derry. But it's weird because in the movie, it doesn't really make any sense because he basically, it basically comes back to kill people and he basically shows Mike like, hey, uh, I'm back. Tell everyone to come back here so I can kill you. But in the novel, he's actually kind of afraid of the kids. He doesn't want them coming back. And the whole reason for them forgetting is because it didn't want them coming back. So why would he like, you know, tell him, hey, come back and try to fight me again. Why would he do that if he's afraid of them? He, he, he's, he already got his ass kicked one time. He doesn't want to deal with that shit again. But basically, in Mike's, I guess you'd say, uh, Mike's story arc where he calls everybody, it's after the, uh, gay, uh, the gay couple die. He sees a, uh, a bloody message written on the side of the overpass saying, like, I think it's like, welcome home or something like that, or I'm coming back. I forget what it says, but... It, it's it's different. It kind of doesn't really make any sense in a, a... It's almost like a loophole in the story. Like, they just kind of... They, they close their eyes and they just said, Oh, well, F it. We're just going to tell them to come back. Which doesn't make any sense when it comes to actually the story and why they forgot their memories. But whatever. After they all come back together, they actually go to a Chinese restaurant and they kind of have their camaraderie with each other and they remember each other and all these memories kind of flood back to them. And it's pretty interesting and heartwarming. And I like the camaraderie with Richie and the other characters and stuff like that. He's, I mean, he kind of steals the spotlight whenever they're having their their group moment where they're all together and talking with each other because he's so funny and the actor's so funny. Uh, what is it? Bill Hader? I think that's what his name Yeah, Bill Hader. That he does steal the show and a lot of people like Ben and Mike, the old Spice guy, kind of just uh, get kind of dropped out in the back. Other than Mike and Ben kind of getting shut out and Richie stealing a lot of the spy spotlight and dialogue and the kind of group mentality when they're all together... It uh, it works out. Like I actually really like their their camaraderie together, and that's one of the better parts of the movie when they're all together. But I'm getting off topic. Let's stick to the Chinese restaurant and this scene. So when they're all together in the Chinese restaurant, I know um, if you ever watched the It show or the It the old movies that came out, um, there's a scene where they're in the Chinese restaurant and they're all together and they're talking as adults. Well you know, their fortune cookies break out and there's like eyeballs in them and weird stuff like that in the old movie. Well, in this movie, what happens is like, the the same thing happens where they break the, the what is it called? The fortune cookies break. And there's these weird creatures that come out of it. There's like a baby weird bug thing. There's an eyeball with like tentacles. There's the uh, this weird fortune cookie with wings that is attacking people. And the whole group is all yelling and screaming, but it's weird because in the background, there's like a, um, 
an aquarium with fish and things like that. And what happens is there's a bunch of heads floating and singing music while this is all happening. And it's kind of strange and it's weird and off tone because the, the creature's all CGI and pretty out in the open. It's not like they weren't concealed at all. The Chinese restaurant was kind of A, it was kind of easy to tell that it was going to happen anyways. Because if you've seen the old, I guess it's a TV show of it, you would you know what's about to happen. So the first thing, that wasn't very surprising just because everyone saw the old movie and it's basically a shot. It's a, it's a, it's a retake, basically. So that was all right. But it was goofy because afterwards, the uh, the one of the one of the ladies who work at the restaurant comes back in. And she just kind of walks in, and she can't see any of the monsters. So she just kind of sits there, like, "Are you guys all right?" Because people are like, at, you know, and running in the corner of the walls, like swinging at nothing. And then uh, Richie has a chair, just like smashing the 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 monsters that are in his head on the table, just like, ah, die, 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 and he's, like, smacking shit and knocking stuff out of the room, and when she comes in the room, she's just looking around, like, what the fuck is going on right now, and, uh, it, it's kind of funny, and then once Richie sees her, all the monsters go away, and he's like, uh, yeah, um, we just need to check, or whatever, and it just, like, kind of cuts off in, like, a funny, like, a, almost like a funny Marvel sort of way, kind of like, oh, this is awkward, ooh, and it just kind of, I don't know, it wasn't scary. The monsters were scary. The situation was pretty goofy. And then when she came back, they ended it off with a joke. And this is, like, not a comedy movie, you know what I mean? And they could have played the scene off a little better and a little more, I guess I'd say, a little scarier, make it dark, maybe to turn off the lights or something. I don't know, something. They could have done a multitude of things to make the scene scarier. But it almost felt like they weren't even trying. They were just like, ah, oh, well, you know, this is when they come back. We're just going to do a quick scare, quick scene get it over with, and then end it off with a joke. And the movie was so funny because, like, at that point, they ended off with a joke, and everyone was like, ha-ha. Like, I was in the theaters the, the, the first showing, right? And people were laughing. Like, people who really wanted to see it and got to the first showing were all laughing in the movie, and I was like, this is really strange. Like, in an It movie, where the movie's supposed to be about depression and childhood trauma, and it's supposed to be a horror movie. I mean, it's, even the classifications on, like, if you go to Wikipedia or whatever, it's called, it says drama, thriller, horror, or whatever. And there's comedy. Like, people are laughing their ass off in this movie. I was like, this is, like, the weirdest tone for an It movie, you know? And then uh, as they're leaving the restaurant, this little kid comes up to him, and he's like, I, I forget what he, the, the kid says. It's like, um, um, he says a line from his show, Richie's show, his stand-up or whatever, and it, the line, I forget what the line is, but it basically sounds like he, like, like, it is talking through him, and then Richie runs up to the kid, and he's like, oh, you want some of this? Like, are you trying to fight me? Because he thinks it's it that's talking, right? And, uh, the kid's like, dude, it's a line from your show, and he's like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, or whatever, and it's like another joke after a joke that already happened, and I was kind of like, this tone of this movie, like, I really hope it's not going to stay like this. Like, is it going to stay like this? Like, I hope it's, like, the only part of the movie where it's, like, kind of goofy. And then they get into, like, the actual it stuff. But it just seems like the comedy keeps going on throughout the, the movie. And I was like, what? what is this tone? Why is the tone so off in this movie? Like, it's a fucking it movie. Like, please, goddamn. And they, they just, throughout the whole movie, ends up being like that. So... Let me go ahead and uh, explain what happens for the main plot line, and it's 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 weird. So basically, Mike's like, "Hey, Bill, come to my house." They go in there, and he's like, "Okay, check out this relic." And then he gives him a glass of water. The glass of water has some sort of like weird hallucinogen root that he put in it that like he he got from the the Native Americans that showed him the vision vision originally. And then Bill goes on this fucking really weird acid trip where he's seeing, like, the first the first Native Americans and how they fought off it and what you're supposed to do. and how, it, Basically, it's like, it's just a weird acid trip that almost feels like it shouldn't be in the movie. And the turtle in the movie, right? Like, when I, when I was first thinking about, like, the turtle in the novel, there, there's a turtle that I mentioned in uh, my review. Basically, the turtle is, like, the, like the, the, the opposite of it. It's the same type of creature, I guess you'd say, but it's the good version of it, and it, it's basically represented as a giant turtle, and it is represented as an evil clown, so there you go. And in the novel, 
the, the, the turtle is basically the one that explains to them how to defeat it and is the one that helps the children in guiding them into defeating it, basically. So he's kind of a big part of the, I guess I'd say, of the novel. But in this one, they just kind of traded out the crazy situation of a turtle, a giant turtle talking to him that is like an, a galactic turtle. And they transfer it for Native American voodoo magic with acid trips. And I was just like, if you're going to be ridiculous, you might as well just go full ridiculous and just add the turtle in. Either that or just take all that shit out. Like, I don't understand why they were like, well, the turtle is just too much. But a Native American voodoo magic and an acid trip, that'll do. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. So it was weird. But they do that, and basically the plot ends up devolving into a fetch quest. Basically, all the, all the group or whatever has to split up individually, go off by themselves like Scooby-Doo. You know, like Scooby-Doo is like, hey, you guys, we need to split up and we'll cover more ground. And, and everyone's like, why, why do we need to do that? Well, even in the movie, they were explaining, like, Richie's like, well, that's like the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like, why would we need to split up? Like, technically, being together would be the best thing when it hunts people individually. And the, the argument or what they try to say in the, the story is, well, you have to mix the past with the present. And that's just like a fancy way of saying that you have to get an item from your past uh, in a fetch quest, basically. You guys have to go off on your own fetch quest, find an item that you forgot about in the past, bring it with you, go to the lair, we'll stick it in this little bucket, this mine bucket, or not mine bucket, Native American relic bucket or whatever, and then we're going to go ahead and do this ritual, right? And I was like, what? Like, no. Why do you, like, it was good when they're all together. You know what I mean? They already went through the whole situation of them being kids and having to split up. But if you know that it is a monster and attacks people individually and together they're stronger, which was kind of the, that's kind of how they defeated it in the first movie. They had to be all together. So them splitting up, A, doesn't make any sense. B, it's just a way for them to all split up and kind of go and do their own fetch quest in the storyline. And it just, it felt clunky to me. It didn't feel like, the, the first thing, it didn't feel like the It novel. And it just didn't really make any sense in like a, in like just thinking about what you would do in that same situation. Like if people were like, hey, you want to split up? You're like, no, why would we split up? We even got the same hotel because we didn't want to split up. So why are you making me split up now? It doesn't make any sense. So they kind of made them go off on their own adventure, and eh, I'll explain that in a second. So they all go off on their own adventure, and that's all good and gravy and everything like that. And they all kind of meet it in different ways. Like, Richie has this flashback when he's out in the park where this is like one of the stupidest parts in the movie. Um, basically, he sees, you know, like the Paul Bunyan weird... Um, lumberjack dude that's out in the park you kind of see it in the trailer it is kind of floating up over him with the balloons or whatever they uh they show the lumberjack and then the, and then he looks up after seeing it it floats over him he's looking at it and he's looking around and then all of a sudden he looks back in front of him the big lumberjack's just gone and he's like what the hell and then he looks to the right of him and it's like where the jump scares just start just start happening, 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 happening. They just keep shooting out the jump scares like a machine gun at this point. Yeah, the lumberjack almost looks like a creature. Like he looks like a lumberjack, but he's all broken apart and he has these sharp razor teeth. It almost looks like Five Nights at Freddy's, like the animatronic monsters in that video game. Like if you actually look at the lumberjack and you look at the creatures from Five Nights at Freddy's or the robots, you, you would think like, oh, it almost looks like an inspiration from Five, Five, Nights at, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's. And it looked really ridiculous. And then the lumberjack just starts swinging at Richie in this open field in front of like everybody. And he just starts swinging at him. And Richie falls over. He's like, it's not real. It's not, it's not real. It's not real. And then the lumberjack just disappears and everything's back to normal. And I just I did not find that scary. It just felt kind of weird. It was kind of weird but and kind of strange. But it, it wasn't It wasn't like a... It didn't have any buildup to it. It wasn't like there was like a weird creepy moment where like it's in the shadows. Like it just kind of shows up in broad daylight. It's like, hey, buddy, what you doing? I'm here. I'm back. I'm ready to kill you. And then Richie's like... No, and then all of a sudden, this big lumberjack is like trying to swing at him like like King Kong with a car or something like that. It, it felt out of place in the movie, to be honest. So I don't know. I don't know why they did that. It, it, there was no build up. It was just a jump scare. It actually kind of caught me off guard. Like I didn't get like I didn't get like super jumped, but I kind of just like twitched for a second because it was one of those moments where the sound drops and all of a sudden 
he looks at a corner of him, and all of a sudden a loud bang happens, and then there's the monster, and he just screams like Godzilla and just starts swinging at him. So it was just, it was out of place, it was weird, it wasn't really, like, there was no build-up towards that scare, and it was just, it was just weird. I don't know, I don't know why they did that. So Eddie goes on his, fe his fetch quest just like everybody else, and another stupid situation happens. He goes to the pharmacy to find his placebo uh, puffer that is kind of his fetch quest item he has to pick up for this ritual. And he goes to the same pharmacy, and he sees the same people, and that's kind of cool, they just look a little older. And he decides to go down in the basement. Well, the, the first thing he goes down in the basement, he sees a bunch of dirty needles and broken glass on the ground and blood packs probably filled with AIDS or some other crazy stuff, hepatitis C. And he decides, oh, well, I should probably keep going. I think it's either his mother or his wife that's supposedly hooked up on this, like, stretcher. And she's saying, Eddie, you need to help me. There's this monster that's after me. I'm hooked up. He's going to kill me. And it's this, uh, it's the same leper from the first movie in this one. The leper is, he's kind of like guided on this like rail where he can only go forwards at his mother to attack him. And she's like, he's trying to unhook her or his mother or wife or whatever. And uh, the leper is kind of sh sh slowly shuffling at him. And the mask comes off, it's the leper from the first movie. And I was like, all right, cool, the leper's back, whatever. And Eddie actually started beating the shit out of this leper. I was like, cool, Eddie, you're getting it. You're, you're understanding that, you know, it's just all fake. He grabs him by the throat and everything's cool. And then he gets thrown up on by the leper. And they could have just kept it where the tone was kind of dark or it was supposed to be a, a uh, um, like, you know, it's supposed to be monstrous. It wasn't that scary, but they could have just kept it in more of a darker, serious tone. And as he's strangling this thing, it throws up on him. There's this goofy-ass music that comes on, like 80s music, goofy 80s music that comes on while he's getting puked on, like almost like a funny sort of music, like a punchline type of music for a funny moment that happened. And he's like, oh, what the heck? He threw up on me, and then he just runs out of the place. They could have just left it off with with him, you know, having to fight for his life or something crazier, you know, maybe he could have gotten hurt or something like that. But they just decided to make it like a funny, hilarious moment at the end. And this is why I keep saying like the the whole the comedy in this movie just sucks all the tension out of the movie, like completely. And then they just kind of leave it off with a funny moment at the end. And you're like, wow, that was just a hilarious moment, you know, where I almost got killed by a leper. It's like, why are you trying to make it funny? Just keep going. So that, that's another stupid part of the movie. Let me go on to the next one. Another dumb part of the movie is actually the old lady scene where Beverly Marsh goes in this old lady's house. And it's, it's a good moment, but also they kind of ruin it at the end. I'll, I'll explain. Basically, all the good parts in this movie are from the trailers. All the trailers have all the good moments in it. So if you saw any of the cool moments in the trailers, you're like, oh, that is going to be a good movie if they're showing this much. Well, no. All the good stuff's in the trailers. They basically put all the greatest parts of the movie in the trailers. And if you saw the trailers, you probably saw the best parts in the movie. That's all I'm trying to say. Anyways, Beverly Marsh goes into the, uh, the, the old woman's house. And if you've seen the trailers, you know what I'm talking about. The old lady's like, oh, you know... No one in Derry really ever dies, and then she has that like creepy smile and stuff like that. That's what you need more in the movie is this kind of where it is kind of just effing with you, you know, kind of pulling you in, psychologically messing with you, kind of slowly building up to a scare. You know, when she's peering around the corner, that's creepy. All that stuff's good. They end up kind of messing up the situation or the scare where you know how in the end of the trailer, the, the old lady's like running at her. Well, what happens is in the movie, they show the face and she's basically just this big CGI mess where she's like this long monster and she's like these big ass titties just kind of flapping in the air while she's like running after her. And it actually ended up becoming kind of funny because it was, it was scary and it was off-putting. Like you didn't want this like old lady with these big old like, you know, hanging down to her knees, boobs, like smacking you in the face or anything like that. So it was definitely off-putting, but it just, it didn't come off as scary. It came off as goofy as fuck and it just, I don't know. They, they didn't really make that scene any better by showing off the crazy CGI mess that they made. If they would have kept it more subtle where the lady was just like a weird skeleton thing coming after her or it was like the clown, it like it's just his face kind of pops up on her. That would have been better than having this big CGI monster. Like it was like a nine foot tall, weird lanky CGI monster with boobs hanging out. It was weird. And they kind of messed up that scene. Um... I'll tell you some of the good stuff. I'll, I'll tell you the two best scenes, though, in the movie, by far. So Bill found out there's this little kid that's actually living in his old house, you know, the same house that 
you know, Georgie ended up dying where he was living and everything like that. So he's seeing this little kid as, like, the new Georgie that could possibly die. So Bill definitely has the best story arc, in my opinion, and it actually does mess with him a lot more than the other characters. And let me explain. So as he's going off, you know, looking, he's looking for his item, his fetch quest item, and he's looking around and he sees that drain that Georgie basically died in. And he sees that it is, you know, representing Georgie in that drain, and he's handing him that, that, uh, that little boat. That's the fetch quest item that he needs. Like an idiot, he throws his arm in there to grab the fetch quest item, and then it grabs his arm, almost like Georgie, it was going to rip it off, and then it ends up just kind of giving him the boat for some reason. Like, that's an item that's supposed to kill it, and it is just like, oh, yeah, here you go, buddy. It was just kind of weird, it didn't make any sense for, like, the story arc, and then also, too, um, his arm should have been taken off, right? Like, he, he, like, it can, like, chomp a hole through you. So I'm not sure how he got his arm back, especially the way they, they show. There's, like, a bunch of baby arms grabbing onto him, and he couldn't get away. And then he, he gets away, and he sees all these, like, little beady eyes. I thought that was kind of a cool moment, all these little beady eyes looking at him in the drain and then just kind of disappear. Well, when he gets back out, you know, of the drain, and this little kid's looking at him like, what the heck was just going on just now? And Bill's like, kid, do not go near the drains. Do not go near any dark places. Don't go anywhere where there's uh, any weird whispering clowns or babies or children or weird creepy shit like that. Don't don't go near any of that. If you hear anybody whispering to you, if anything's trying to kind of, you know, telling you to come over to it, do not go because you just don't, you know? And the kid's like, all right, weird crazy guy. Don't, you know, don't get all crazy with me. And as he's walking off, the kid's like, well, there is people that whisper to me in my drain, like in my bathroom, like my bathroom sink drain. Bill just walks up to him and just grabs him by the shirt. He goes, okay, buddy, you need to just tell your parents to get out of here. Get out of town. Go as far as you can. And the kid just kind of brushes him off like, all right, you're obviously crazy. Um, he probably should have said stranger, stranger danger at that part, to be honest. I, he was definitely acting crazy. Bill's acting crazy, but at least you know why, you know? One of my favorite parts of the movie is where Bill goes to the carnival and he sees the same kid that he was trying to protect. Well, it is trying to hurt Bill as much as possible. Kind of like, hey, I'm going to kill another Georgie sort of deal. And, you know, that kid's supposed to represent Georgie and all. So the kid goes into the fun house, you know, the worst place you could possibly go if a monster's trying to hunt you. And Bill runs in there to go save him. Well, he goes into the hallway of mirrors and it's on the other side and he's right there on the other side. And it almost like the kid got stuck in a box and it starts slamming his head into the glass, almost like, you know, those little, those little like punching bags that you have, not like a, not like a heavy bag, but you know, where you hit it and it kind of bounces off the floor and comes back. Well, that's what it was doing, but like with his body, it was kind of, it was kind of goofy, but I'm okay with him being a little goofy, he's supposed to be a clown, so it, but like a killer clown. So he's like bouncing and slamming his head in a thing, and then... Bill is trying to break the, the glass, too. Well, what happens is the kid ends, ends up dying. He gets crunched, and uh, the blood splatters on the wind or windshield. He spl it splatters on the uh, glass, and Bill's like, oh, man. Um, you know, it was really trying to toy with him and hurt him as much as possible. And that's a good part of the movie. It actually shows that Bill's trying to sit... It actually shows that Bill's trying to save this kid as if he was Georgie and doesn't want another Georgie situation happening. So that was pretty touching. I like that part of the movie. That's where they needed to go with a lot of the scares in the movie, you know, have kind of a, a touching thing to it that's supposed to kind of wrench your heart or at least, you know, a metaphor for something else. That's a lot, at least in the novel, they do a lot of that. Um, another, the, actually my favorite, the best kill in the movie, um, and I'll explain to you right now, is the little girl. So this little girl is sitting there at this ballpark. Mom's kind of like trying to watch a baseball game. And, you know, little girls are probably like, I don't want to watch baseball. So she's just sitting there all bored. And she sees this little uh, firefly just kind of buzzing around. And it's, you know, fireflies make the little bright light or whatever. And she's trying to grab it. Oh, let me grab it. And it kind of goes off underneath the bleachers. She follows the flies. She follows it, follows it. And then all of a sudden, out of the dark in the back of the bleachers, it grabs the firefly, and then he brings it up to his face, and then you can see the light coming off, you know, off the firefly onto his face. And he says, hello. And, you know, that's kind of one of the trailer scenes where he, you see the hands pop out, and he goes, hello. So that's another trailer scene, and that's one of the better scenes in the movie. Um, 
she's sitting there like, oh, hey, you know, and it's a scary clown, so she's kind of freaked out. She's like, oh, well, all right, creepy clown, what are you, what's going on here? He's like, oh, I'm your friend. Come over closer to me. And she's actually a pretty smart little girl. She goes, no. Ah, you're not my friend. I don't know you. Stranger danger. You're, you're a weird, creepy clown. I don't like you. And then she walks away. The interesting thing about this little girl is that she has this blotch on her face. It looks like either A, a burn mark, or B, it's like a weird um, either growth or um, what is it called? It's a weird birthmark is what I'm trying to say. It's like a weird birthmark growth. I don't know what you could call it. It's just like a little blotch on her face that looks kind of weird. In elementary school or middle school or whatever age she's in, you know, kids are rude and they're mean and they'll probably say mean things to her about that blotch. Well, when she says to it, like, oh, you're creepy, I don't like you, and starts walking off, it starts crying. <laughs> you don't like me because I look creepy and I'm weird looking, right? And as she's turning away, she hears that and she kind of sits there and thinks for a second, like, oh, well, I get the same abuse. You know, people think that I'm strange looking, I'm weird or whatever, and nobody likes talking to me. So when it was saying that, he's very, he's being very manipulative to this little girl. He's actually using her weaknesses against her. And that's what it's supposed to be about. He's supposed to be using your weaknesses against you, you know, your, your self-doubt and things like that. So he's sitting there, oh, you don't like me, I'm crying, oh, I don't, you know, you obviously don't like me, I'm never going to have a friend. And she says, oh, well, you know, kids do that same thing to me, you know, like, I can be your friend. So she walks up to him, and it's like, oh, I'm magical, I can just kind of blow that little mark off your face if you come closer to me. And she's like, you can do that? He goes, yeah, I'm magic, I can, I can do that. I'll just blow that little mark off your face, and you'll never have it again. And she's like, all right. So she gets closer to him. And he goes, on the count of three, I'll blow it off your face. And she's like, okay. And he says, count of three, one, two. And then at three, he pauses for like way too long of a time. And he has like this kind of ridiculous looking face, just kind of like, he's almost like savoring the moment. He even has like drool coming out of his mouth. And then she goes, you're supposed to say three. And as she says that, he comes out and chomps her head off. So that was a really cool moment in the movie because he's being manipulative. He's, he's attacking her weaknesses. He's doing all the things that it's supposed to be about. He's supposed to be a mental monster. He's supposed to be attacking your weaknesses mentally. He's not supposed to be a monster that just kind of runs at you like a lumberjack with an axe just swinging at you. Like, that. that's out of character. And that, that was the best portrayal of it in the movie was that little girl part. It was by far the best scene in the movie, like, hands down. So that was my favorite scene. Now let me go on to the next scene. So Henry Bowers is a complete waste of time in this movie. They show a really cool scene where he's in a mental institute and he sees the, the red balloon outside his window, you know, like the, the, the red balloon that you know from it. And as he's being pulled away by the, I guess he's like the, the psych security people or whatever, um, they're grabbing him. They're like, all right, you're getting too crazy because he saw the balloon outside. He starts going kind of hysterical for this balloon. He's like grabbing onto the rails and like jumping around like a monkey and stuff like that. So they're like, nope, you get into your room. This is enough of that. You're, you're done with fun time. And as they're pulling him in, you can see the balloon uh, kind of trail with him outside, you know, through the windows. He's watching it as he's being pulled. He gets inside his house or his house, I guess his room or whatever, and this balloon pops up underneath his bed. And this is actually kind of a cool scene. He tries to pull the balloon and the balloon pops like right in front of him. It's a big balloon. It's underneath his bed. It's like stuck underneath his bed. And it pops, and then this uh, this big zombie creature, you know, one of his friends, I forget, the, the, the long, skinny friend, um, pops up underneath and, like, like chases at him, like Smeagol or whatever. And he's like, oh, shit, it's a zombie, you know? He's, he's, he's afraid. And then the guy smiles with a zombie face and then gives him his knife back in his good old days, right? Like when he was a, a, a bully. And it is obviously the monster, and he's trying to make Henry Bowers, you know, go off on a killing rampage. Well... Later in the movie, they show that Henry Bowers killed one of the security people, drops him, and then escapes. And he escapes with the zombie driving the car, and it's a little goofy. I'm okay with that, but it's also in the book. Like, they could have done a little something different. You know, could have just had him escape. So I was like, great. Henry Bowers is out and about. He's about to get wreak some havoc on the Losers Club. And he has a zombie friend. He has the car. He has the knife. He's all good to go. Let's do it. And in the novel, basically what he does is he walks up to Mike in the library and then stabs him in the leg. They go into this, they have this full out brawl in the library and he almost mortally, mortally wounds what? Mike. Blech. Mortally wounds Mike. That was kind of hard to say for some reason. And uh, he stabs him in the femoral artery and he has to go to the hospital because of that because he's bleeding out. Like he's severely injured. And uh, 
what happens is when Mike is in the hospital, there's a hospital scene where it actually possesses one of the nurses that is trying to kill him. So there's a whole scene with Henry and it working together in conjunction to kill the Losers Club. And that that's actually a really cool, I'd say, part in the novel. But in the book, what happened, or not in the, not in the book, but in the, uh, in the movie, what happens is that he escapes. He goes up to Eddie while he's like, brushing his teeth or doing something, I forget what he's doing, um, in the bathroom, and stabs him in the face. And and uh, Eddie's like, whoa, I got stabbed in the face. And, you know, it's just stabs him through the cheek, just the cheek or whatever, nothing mortal. And he takes it out, and then he just stabs Bowers. And Bowers is like, ow, I got stabbed. Henry just kind of falls out the window, and he just kind of looks at Eddie with, like, a smirk, takes out his knife, and then he's never seen in the movie again. He literally did nothing in the movie. He just kind of said, he's like, oh, see you, bye. And Henry's a really big part in the novel. He, he works with It to kill the Losers Club. He's basically like teammates with It. And he also represents like when abuse and trauma go the worst possible direction. So they just like completely effed his, his whole story arc up. Like there was no need for him to even be in the movie or even in the first movie after what they did here. So I don't know. I don't know why they did that. They they could have taken some other scenes out and then actually worked on his scene. That would have been pretty, it would have been a lot better that way, at least in my opinion. There's a couple other scenes I'm just not going to get into. There's like a Beverly scene with with uh, with Ben where they're kind of both drowning. One is in sand and one is in blood. It wasn't really that great. I mean, there's nothing to really talk about on those scenes. They're just both dying and then he, he admits his love for her and then they both get out. It's just whatever. But um, we'll go on to the ending with the, the It or the it spider monster or whatever. So as you we were saying earlier in the movie, um, how Stephen King is just like, oh, you can't end movies. Well, well they, they, they ended the movie just as bad or if not worse than Stephen King in his book. So whatever. Basically what happens is they go into the sewers from the house down that well and down another well and down another well and down. They just, they just keep going down. They basically get down to the point where there was like this original meteor that crash landed on Earth that had it in it. And it looked kind of like a meteor actually crashed there. And it was really weird. It was like way underneath the ground. It's where it supposedly like hit its domain actually is. And it's like even further beneath the ground than where the sewers are. It's almost like in Dark Souls when you go from the depths into Blight Town. It's weird. It's just like they just kept going even further down the hole. It's like, Jesus, how far you have to go? At that point, they're there at the meteor. They put all their fetch quest items in the thing to fight the big ending boss or whatever. And it turns out that Mike was lying to them. And he was like, oh, well, the Native Americans actually got eaten when they tried this the first time. And you guys, uh, I, I just tried to see if it worked this time. And you're like, oh, great. That doesn't make any sense, Mike. What the hell? And it, it just, I don't know. The, the ending was just not, it was just not good. So there's a bunch of comedy in it. There's a part in the ending fight where Richie and Eddie are running away from it. And they find these two doors, or these two doors. There's these three doors that say scary or not scary, very scary, or not scary, scary, very scary. <clears throat> don't know why that was so hard to say. At that point, they pick the non-scary door. They see a Pomeranian, like the little fluffy dog, in there. And you just know it's going to be a scary monster. And even even Richie says, hey, well, this is going to be a scary monster. I know you're a scary monster. Get away from me. It turns out to be a scary monster. They both run away scared. And it's, it's, it's a whole funny, like, joke sort of deal that happens. And this is the ending fight with it. It's supposed to be like a kind of a climactic moment. And there's supposed to be a lot of emotion involved, but it just ends up feeling like they just decided to use comedy in that moment, even though it shouldn't have been comedy. Another thing is, is that it looks like a giant spider, but the spider torso, I guess you say the torso up, is the clown it, and then the bottom half is actually like spider. So it was like this, they, they didn't even try to change it from the books, really. They just kind of changed it a little bit. It was slightly better. It wasn't anything monumentally better in any way so i don't know why they were kind of bitching at stephen king about how great or how bad the ending was but how our ending is going to be so much better it was worse to be honest there's also another funny moment with richie where richie is trying to get it away from the group and he's throwing a rock at him and as he throws a rock at him he's like oh come on over here buddy you know fight me and all of a sudden it just is used he uses his uh, deadlights you know the big bright lights that's supposed to be like the internal thing, or like, it's basically everything in the galaxy from future to, er, you know, future to past and everything. It's supposed to turn crazy. And he shoots it right at Richie as he's mid-sentence. But, so you basically see him just to be like, you get away from my friends. And then all of a sudden the light hits him. 
And then he just goes, Ugh! and he has like this really retarded face like he's just dead. You know what I mean? And it actually comes off as kind of funny. It doesn't come off as scary at all. He just, you get away, you bastard. And he's just like that mid-sentence. It's really goofy. And it didn't really seem scary at that point. It was goofy. It, was, it made me laugh, actually. So I don't know why they did that either. They should have done something something a little different instead of trying to enforce more comedy into the movie. Put more comedy, please. No, no. They end up killing it by just yelling curse words at it and saying, oh, you're small, you're insignificant, you're weak, you're this, you're that. And that's different than in the... In the novel, the novel does kind of the same thing with the slingshot and shooting, you know, metal into the, the creature, kind of like the, the old movie slash TV show. But what it is is that they have to believe hard enough that these uh, pieces of silver are going to hurt it, like like almost like a monster movie. It's almost like putting your will versus his will, and whoever's will stronger actually will win in the, the end. But in this one, it's almost like they just like, oh, well, if you just talk shit to it you'll make him a smaller person if you believe that about him. So they basically just, like, bombard him with, like, almost like South Park sort of sounding, you know, bombardment of curse words and, like, oh, you're little, you're insignificant, you're nothing, you're blah, 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 you're this and that. And it ends up becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And he becomes, like, this, like, little... Sorry, there's a fly in my room. There, he ends up becoming a small little baby it. Like, just tiny little baby, like a shriveled ball sack. And then they just rip his heart out and then kill him. And that's the, the movie. And it's just... Eh. Yeah, I don't know. The, the ending was just a little worse than the other ending in the novel or anything else, so I don't know what you were talking about, about Stephen King having bad endings and need to switch it up because eh, their ending was worse, so I don't know. I don't know what you guys are talking about. The other thing that was also kind of interesting is that Stan, the guy who ended up killing himself in the beginning of the movie, he ends up setting them like a suicide note at the end, and he's explaining that he wasn't strong enough to fight it, and he knows he would hold everybody back because he was the weakest, and everybody kind of agreed with that statement, like, way too easily. Everyone was like, oh, uh, yeah, you are pretty weak and insignificant. We don't really like you. It was like, why are you guys shitting on Stan so much? Jesus. Everyone just agreed. Yeah, Stan was just the weakest of us. That's why he killed himself. You know, they just kind of, like, shit on Stan the whole time. It was weird. But at the end, with the death note, death note, I like that show. No, with the uh, suicide note, suicide letter, um, Stan's like, oh, I, uh, I was too weak and insignificant, and... You guys need to go off without me, and if I killed myself, then it would bring you guys closer together, and you guys would do it for me, kind of. You know, kind of. He he was kind of like the crux that would have kind of uh, catalyst. You know, he was like the catalyst that got everyone together, kind of. And that doesn't make any sense, first of all. And in the novel, what Stan is supposed to represent is when people can't deal with their traumas, and he never gets a redemption from that in the novel. It, it's just a sad moment. At the end of the movie, it they try to convey him as a hero. Eddie's not supposed to be a martyr. He's supposed to be what happens when you can't deal with your trauma and the worst possible thing happens and you just can't deal with yourself because of this trauma. And he kills himself. He has no redemption in the novel. And it's supposed to be more... It's supposed to be scarier and more surreal than in this movie where they try to make him, like, a hero because of it. It's like, no, don't do that. Don't try to make Stan, like, a good person because he kill, or killed himself. That's it, it, almost like making light of the situation of death, and, it, and you're not not death, but suicide, or you can't even live with yourself. It's supposed to be a negative thing. It's supposed to be depressive. Let it be that way. That's what the whole point of that was. So I don't know, you guys. Let me know what you think about the movie. I, I thought it was all right. I thought it was like above average. It was, all really had to do with the the acting ability and the way they portrayed the characters. But other than that, a lot of the parts in this movie were actually pretty bad, in my opinion. So there you go, you guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please comment down below. Let me know what you guys think about the movie. Let me have it. Maybe you really enjoyed the movie. I have no clue. Please click the little bell if you want notifications from me. And then until next time, you guys, see ya!